Usually you learn from failure. Uh, success is uh, just put on us more responsibility. It's one of those things where you work so hard and you, you put your heart and soul into a project and you work on it for two, two and a half years and to see it be accepted and enjoyed by you know the, the seven-year-old kids and the 77-year-old grandmothers, it's really, it's, it's just that justification that, that what you worked on and the, what you toiled over, people enjoyed and they wanted to put down their $10 and, and spend some more time with the characters that you know Steve Ditko and Stan Lee created you know, 42 years ago. Spider-Man is always about themes, about where, where do we take Peter Parker now? And Movie 2 had this uh, amazing opportunity to see the hero who can no longer carry the mantle because you look at him as just a kid and you say, realistically, it should get to him. You know I understand but I thought you'd learn the meaning of responsibility. We knew we had something quality going on because it was there on the page. And um, from the page, it translated to the screen and uh, the critics really loved it and so did the fans. One of the things about this DVD business, it allows us to revisit uh, scenes that the public didn't see. And actually, there is a void. I mean, there is a hunger and thirst for, for Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Mike, congratulate you. Congratulations. Good luck in the world. It's surprising that some sequences literally were unchanged from the first cut. Like the raindrops keep falling on my head sequence. I mean, that just stayed the way it was because it kind of was what it was. The good thing about Spider-Man 1 is like pretty much everybody saw it. So we knew from the get-go that we didn't really need to overly explain a lot of things. But at the same time, <clears throat> you know, you still need to reestablish the characters and their relationships, you know, hopefully as efficiently as possible without, um, you know, boring the audience. A perfect example of that was um, in the birth birthday party sequence. That was always a, a, a tough sequence to figure out because, um, you know, you're sort of reintroducing a lot of the characters from the first movie. And it, you know, it, it, it can become a soap opera because there's so much stuff going on and, and you really don't want to overstate everything because you don't want it to seem overly dramatic and overly protracted because the audience is going to want to sit through it. But at the same time, you want just enough to really um, sort of establish the, the conflicts and characters and then sort of move on to the next thing. Be honest with me. If you knew who he was, would you tell me? We thought it would be better to sort of leave it at a dramatic high when we when the conflict got introduced and leaving it at a more more of a tense moment as opposed to letting the scene play out i'm sorry i don't mean to rag on you on your birthday you're my buddy you know that your family pete my father loved you you're like a son to him Happy it was also at the beginning of the movie where you sort of want the pace to be a little quicker and move on to the next thing and introduce the villain and all this other stuff. So it was just, um, scenes like that are always a struggle to try to basically figure out dramatically where it needs to start and end. I'm Spider-Man, but I'm losing my powers. I'm, I'm climbing a wall, but I keep falling. Oh. What's your major? Theater arts? Science. Connors? Uh-huh. He flunking you? He says he might. There you go. And you'll see the things that are there that you didn't see in a movie. It's there for one reason. Because we just, there was no, the movie would have been too long. We actually did end up shooting um, what you'll see on the disc is a, a fight where Ock and Spidey crash into a law office and duke it out in there. And we shot that. We just never had the resources um, during post-production number two to finish those sequences. That was actually shot by uh, Dan Bradley, the stunt coordinator with um, Spidey and uh, Doc Ock. 
and we ended up not including that just for budgetary reasons, you know, because even as big as this movie was, you know, this, you know, you, you can't afford everything. Hal Sparks was, was hired in the first place beyond the fact that he's a really good actor. It's just his ability to riff and to, to be spontaneous. How you doing? And for a long time when we were filming those scenes, we just let Sam just let Hal and Toby go at it back and forth. Cool Spidey outfit. Thanks. Can I riff for you? Can I come up with a couple ideas for you? Just what my company would do? Let's see what I got. How about um, a children's book? You could uh, have like Charlotte's Web, but without the pig. You could do um, a men's cologne called Thwip. We probably had 25 takes. Um, Actually, we went in the movie with the first version. Looks uncomfortable. Uh, it gets kind of itchy. <clears throat> doesn't help, I do that all the time. Slow elevator. <laughs> Jay Jonah putting on the Spidey suit was always a good scene. And I, re I really don't know why we cut it out of the movie other than I think a lot of people had a different idea of what the scene was gonna be like from the script. As scripted, it was this overweight guy with a paunch who's kind of, you know, jumping around the Spidey costume and posing and all that. And it was really funny. And then to see Jake's Kate do it, it was still funny, but He's, pre he's in pretty good shape, and so we, we just didn't know if the gag played as well, but um, we think upon hindsight it did. We had to bring, obviously, Bob Morowski back, our, our editor and, and our visual effects editor, Jody Fidel, because Jody was really key in clawing through all that footage. So we had segments and bits of, of, of um, Alfred doing certain things. And we also took some stuff that we shot in Chicago, of um, especially the reaction of the people as Spidey and Ock are fighting on the side of the train and, and they're going through a train stop and the people going back. And you know, it was really a lot of um, you know, Bob and Jody going through with Sam and finding those moments to, to beef up that segment. And, you know, we had to crew up a little bit at, at SPI to get some animators back and some, some of their CG artists. Here's where we track all our finals and shots in progress. Each shot has a little thumbnail of representing what the shot is. And as it moves from started to being in film out to final, we move them all around this board and uh, manage them all by shot name. Here you can see they're all final, so we're happy that they're all done. Each one of these shots represents a lot of work by a lot of different artists, so we're gonna go walk over and look at some of the artists who worked on these shots. Hey, John. Hey, Scott. Brought a bunch of people with me to, <laughs> to take a look at some of these shots. So why don't you go ahead and, uh, and show me the shot and talk about what you did here. Okay. So we've got, yeah, blue screen dock that was actually taken from a completely different shot. It was flopped and then uh, <laughs> repositioned to fit here with uh, a CG tentacle. The remainder of the background and all the other elements are all CG. Yeah, I love some of these poses and images we get at the end here. Just certain, there's certain times where Spider-Man's poses really are that uh, classic Spider-Man pose. Really, really dynamic. Yeah. For the feature, they made a decision not to shoot anamorphic, which we talked them into because it gives us a lot of problems in post. So they ended up shooting the entire movie Super 35 and through a digital process went to anamorphic on release. And the cool thing actually is that while we're working on it, we actually put the mask on like John just had it and composed for 235, but we deliver as much as we can outside. So. When you get the DVD, you're actually seeing more image. So this is one of our most difficult shots because, you know, we really didn't have much to go on creating it from kind of scratch. Uh, the background we did find at Chicago Plate, but all the action here had to be animated and, and clothed and created from ground up. I think what you did with the tentacles, getting all those kicks on the tentacles helped. And just getting the right flashes of, of his face is really what you effectively did. As far as 
him laying down at the beginning, that actually helped a lot because it would make a darken his face. That's good. And keep them all in shadow. Uh, and then the end of the shot actually was not as much of a problem either. It's just that transition, I think. The transition, the fast whip up. Right. That's where you literally had to go frame by frame, right. I think, that right? That was the, the trickiest part of the shot. Is it true that you even patched in a real, like, photo of Doc on uh, There's one the frame of, uh, of a real Doc face mixed in with the CG Doc. Just to keep it real. Just to... The trick is to find that frame. Yeah. Even more than in Spider-Man 2, a lot of the difficult claw shots, we had to do these high impact hits. So what sort of special things did you have to do to, to make this work here? Uh, for this, I had to worry about uh, the beginning part, which is this part right here, and then I had uh, the impact and the after impact. The arms were actually coming off, so I had to uh, do some constraints. <laughs> the arms the, were just flying off? Yeah, or, uh, or collapsed. Couldn't have that in a DVD? Yeah, right. <laughs> on Spider-Man 2, we, one of the techniques we learned was to actually stop the train and to blow wind at it, huh. um, instead of having the train move and cover large distances. On this one, what we did, one of the problems with that, even still, was especially during that impact, um, he was still moving so fast, even though the train was stopped, that uh, either the, the solver would sometimes collapse anyway. Right. So that's another reason we had to blend. Uh, we had certain blends specifically for that little section right here, um, and another blend uh, for after, and then there was a lot of cleanup in between. This was a really tough shot in particular because they were so. Um, Spidey and Ock were fighting in such a human way and, and doing um, relatively um, human things um, with some fantastic elements thrown into it. Um, but it was, it's a really tricky balance to get um, the animated characters to feel and look and, and act like humans, but to add that, um, that superhero element to it. Um, and every shot, we're, we're constantly trying to find that balance. We videotaped uh, myself and the animator, Chris Williams, going through some of the moves so that we could um, get a better feel for how the, um, the action should look and what feels natural to do. And there's a couple of moves in particular that came out of that videotape session, and one of them is when Ock elbows Spidey in the stomach. That was something that when I was holding Chris by the neck and trying to struggle with him. It, it felt natural for him to try to elbow me in the stomach, and so we incorporated that into animation. And then there were also a lot of technical um, considerations on a shot like this, too, with, especially with the tentacles and um, the fact that they're on top of a train and the environment, and all of these elements together um, made it for a very difficult shot. So we had to spend a lot of time on the detail and really make sure that, um, that it all read as um, as a, a, a real event that was unfolding at that moment. I think at the end of the day, the theatrical release of Spidey 2 will be the one on record when you talk about Spider-Man. That's going to be the one that um, most people see.